Hi, welcome to This Week in Medicine. Thanks for coming back. It's October 18th, 2021. We're uh, coming to you from the Foxhall Foundation. Uh, remember, we have a stroke initiative program, You Can Prevent a Stroke, which is our book, which is still available and now, I believe, available in paperback. Uh, at the Foxhall Wellness Center, we're starting our nutrition um, this week, uh, In Balance Nutrition PLLC is our email address, so feel free to email if you're interested in a nutrition consultation. These are appointments that can take place uh, in person or virtual, and you can also come to our office for a nutritionist consultation. It's just starting this week, so um, we're gonna go slow and give Carrie a chance to uh, get herself situated at the Foxhall Foundation. Also, we have Yoga with Tala, and we have our adult fitness classes with Ricky at the center. Uh, classes at the center are yoga, Monday and Friday, 7.30, and Saturday, I believe we're starting at 1 p.m., but you might want to check the website to be sure. And then we have our adult movement classes, our Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 12 to 1, so check those out as well. They're very popular. So what stressed you out this week? How to interact with the unvaccinated is still an issue. We had some booster confusion, but hopefully that'll be over by the end of this week when the CDC will meet to discuss what the FDA advisory committee just discussed, which were the Moderna booster and the J&J &J booster, and also unfortunately confusion that's created by getting a J&J &J booster and then wondering, could I also get an mRNA vaccine after my first J&J &J booster? That confusion still exists. Uh, winter holidays and how do we plan for those? CDC did have an updated advisory this week on how to plan for the winter holidays. Um, so if you wanna check that out, it's on the CDC website. The J&J &J second shot probably will be authorized. The FDA advisory panel says that you can go ahead and get it, but remember, we're waiting for CDC. And once CDC says that J&J &J second shot is a good idea, that should be the end of this week. Um, hopefully it will be available. Uh, vaccine for kids, uh, the EUA has been submitted for the Pfizer third dose. So that'll be uh, 10 instead of 30. Um, apparently they're getting these doses ready to ship out. So the manufacturer is preparing doses to be sent uh, for children ages five to 11 to get vaccinated. Uh, if you forgot your vaccine card, be careful because a lot of places are carding you and we don't mean carding 21 years old for drinking alcohol. We mean carding to make sure you've been vaccinated. Uh, we went to the Shenandoahs this weekend. It was lovely and that's a great way to get rid of your stress. Um, you may remember maybe four or five weeks ago, I presented some slides from the CDC on their uh, updated um, vaccine protection against hospitalization, ER visits, and urgent care visits. So this week, the CDC released these charts, which are very interesting. So let's break this down. So we have in the first box, cases, second box, deaths. We have in our bold line, unvaccinated, and then the lighter pink line, vaccinated. And then we have by age category. So we're starting with the young people and we're just gonna move up in chronological age. So we're starting with 12 to 17, we're going to 18 to 29, 30 to 49. And then the next slide, we'll be getting older. So right now, if you look at the young people, it sort of makes sense for uh, uh, death rate that you're not gonna see a difference because we know 12 to 17 year olds don't typically die of COVID illness. Um, but you can see just by case incidence, it's pretty clear. If you're vaccinated, you're not gonna have as many as the unvaccinated. So clearly uh, case rate increasing from uh, being not vaccinated. And then there is some breakthrough right here, a little bit of breakthrough, but no increased deaths. Then we go 18 to 29 still, maybe there's a separation right there where we are seeing an increase in deaths from the unvaccinated population. And here, age 30 to 49, you can already see in this chart, remember that's the deaths, 75 per 100,000 population, we have a blip. So we have an increase in deaths in the unvaccinated population. Remember this line is the unvaccinated cases. This is unvaccinated deaths right there. So it's clear that even at this young age, if you are not vaccinated, you're increasing uh, risk of dying from COVID. This takes a more dramatic spike. When we go to this line, again, deaths in the unvaccinated increases age 50 to 64. Just as we expected, we know that this is a very hard illness for people over 50. 65 to 79, very big spike in deaths. Again, this is the deaths graph for the unvaccinated. And finally, our most risky age group at the octogenarians, big increase in death rate and even some breakthrough cases increase in death rate. So I thought this was very good. It was depicted nicely in the Washington Post and this comes from the CDC. 
Uh, the Pfizer booster recommendations are the same. Um, probably we can mix the vaccines when it comes to J&J &J and the mRNA vaccines, but I would say at this point, still try to stay Pfizer, 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 and Moderna, Moderna, Moderna. So if you're gonna get that third shot, the third shot Moderna will probably be approved on Friday by CDC. The FDA advisory committee already recommended it and we're waiting for CDC. And of course, we went through that same process with FDA and CDC for the Pfizer vaccine. Again, these are the should get vaccinated. Here is the optional may get vaccinated, but this is their advice that you really should think of getting vaccinated if you're in one of these categories. Uh, the FDA advisory panel this past week uh, said that Moderna and Pfizer um, could be used for booster. Um, they also said that, yes, you can get a J&J &J booster. So this is from the AP about the J&J &J booster. The single shot is not as protective as two shots. Uh, Paul Offit, who's an expert in uh, virology and vaccines, said he didn't always think this was a two-dose vaccine, but honestly, this was intended as a one-dose vaccine for portability and for being able to get it out into global distribution with one shot providing 60% protection. Again, that's about the protection we get from a flu shot. So a one-dose J&J &J for portability and global use was not a bad idea. But it is true, even from the beginning of the vaccine research, it was suggested that a second dose of J&J &J was going to be needed. And I saw this in a medical grand rounds talk um, in January of this past year, this data was presented. So the people who made the J&J &J vaccine had data on a second shot. And at that time they told us it would confer 96% protection. This of course was before the Delta variant came on the scene, but at least before that, the second dose of J&J &J vaccine looked extremely good for protection. Um, on Thursday, they also uh, recommended that emergency youth, use authorization for the booster dose of Moderna. Um, so we have J&J &J and Moderna being recommended by the advisory panel. Um, and they unanimously agreed that everybody should get that booster. With Moderna, it's not everyone. With J&J, &J, it's everyone, regardless of age, regardless of underlying medical condition. But the Moderna re uh, recommendations are not for everyone. It's again, for the people who are at particular risk, just like we said with the Pfizer vaccine. Our medical minute this week is ripped from the headlines. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you saw this or how quickly it went under the radar screen, but there are many uh, points for learning from this story. President Bill Clinton hospitalized for infection on the mend, and it was repeatedly said in the media, this is not a COVID infection, and that is true. It was a urinary tract infection. Um, this was uh, in the CNN politics section, but clearly this could have been in the CNN health section or the health section of any newspaper. Again, we're conflating politics and health. Yes, he's a political figure, but the real story here was the health issue not the politics issue. He was in the ICU, I believe, for six days. Uh, that's a long time for a urinary tract infection. So we're gonna break this down so you understand it. And it also involved his bloodstream. That's what we call sepsis, S-E-P-S-I-S, is sepsis, meaning the bacteria got into the bloodstream. How did we get from the urinary tract into the bloodstream? Well, sadly, it happens all the time, and in particular in people over 65. So let's break this down because this is truly an educational point. Genitourinary health. A former president who has educated us on, the, on health and particularly genitourinary health. I don't think I would have known what Pyronius disease was until 1990s from President Clinton. So uh, why is this important? Well, I came across another genitourinary case this week, which was actually not a president. It was just a 60 year old guy whose doctor refused to do a prostate exam on him. Uh, he's a patient of mine who's in Michigan, and I told him that a digital rectal exam as part of his annual physical at 60 years old was actually pretty important. The United States Preventive Health Services Task Force recommendation was against prostate cancer screening in 2012, but they've since backtracked. And they backtracked and said, well, maybe the data actually wasn't entirely against prostate cancer screening. And this is actually true. The meta-analysis data when it was reviewed revealed that patients who were in the study for prostate cancer screening 
were going outside of the study to get prostate cancer screening with their primary care doctors in the form of a PSA and a digital rectal exam. That changed the USPSTF's mind about doing prostate cancer screening, and now they do recommend it. Does this sound similar to what we talked about in our emergency session of This Week in Medicine? It does, because USPSTF said that we should not take aspirin to prevent a heart attack or a stroke. Well, what about a stroke from atrial fibrillation? A baby aspirin, if you don't know you have atrial fibrillation, can protect you from a stroke from AFib. So it's not just about whether or not you have a heart attack, it's about whether or not you have atrial fibrillation. Same thing with prostate exams. Prostate exams are truly for screening for prostate cancer, but there's something else called prostatic growth, or BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy. So checking a prostate is not just because we're looking for cancer. We're actually trying to assess your genitourinary health. And do we know that Bill Clinton, President, former President Bill Clinton, had a problem with his prostate? I would suspect he does. Some of that is based on age because 100% of men by the time they're 80 will have enlargement of their prostate and this can lead to infection. So who can help us with this? Well, your urologist who deals with prostates that infect the bladder, or if you're a woman, a urogynecologist, so they're both urologists and gynecologists, this is a subspecialty, they deal with bladders that get infected in women. Both actually jeopardize your kidneys. We'll show the kidneys in a minute so you can see how this happens. And both are definitely issues related to age. Uh, in women, estrogen and lack of estrogen can be a big issue with this. If you're lacking estrogen because you're postmenopausal, this increases the risk of you getting a bladder infection. So a lot of women are using topical estrogen, which is a great idea. Uh, in men, as I said, by, by age 80, 100% of men have some abnormal prostate tissue growth. And by abnormal, I mean it's getting large and it doesn't need to be because it's not necessary for your health to have a large prostate. So let's break down the female and the male urethras. This is female. This is male. I blocked out a lot of the labels here because I want you to focus really just on the one that says urethra. So a woman's urethra is here. It's the yellow line that snakes up to the bladder, which is right here. So it's relatively short. This is the outside of your body. And this is the short length of urethra. Now let's look at the man's. The man's urethra starts here and it snakes all the way up here, all the way up past the prostate gland. I have a feeling this is a British slide because it says prostata or maybe it's from Europe. At any rate, it's the prostate, not prostata. It snakes through the prostate gland and into the bladder. You can see that it might take bacteria a long time to get all the way up here, but bacteria doesn't take a long time for, to get from there to here. So in a woman, her short urethra helps bacteria climb up and into the bladder. In a man, his long urethra really kind of prevents bacteria from this surface from getting into the bladder. But look what's close to the bladder in a man. It's the prostate gland. So the prostate gland is sitting right next to the bladder. So it's not a short course at all for an infection, enlargement, inflammation of the prostate gland to actually affect the urethra. And then all of a sudden you have a short track into the bladder. So men have a long urethra that generally protects them from infection outside. Women have a short urethra that makes them susceptible to infection coming from outside. That's how these things are a bit different. A man's source of infection is prostate. A woman's source of infection is actually the skin and bacteria that lays around the perineal area. So the long story, short, long story, male urethra. It's long and attaches to the bladder through the prostate gland and then up to the kidneys. So that's how the kidneys connect by the ureters. So long story, short, the short story is the women's urethra. The women's urethra is this long, goes into the bladder and then to the uterus, and again, connects by the ureters to the kidneys. So long story men, short story women, the urethra is our conduit and our pathway to our bladder. For men, their infection comes from their prostate because the prostate's right next to the bladder. For women, the infection comes from the skin and the area around and outside the urethra. So we learned a lot from President Bill Clinton's infection this week, didn't we? And while we're on the, the issue of President Bill Clinton and his health, I think it's time to reassess the blame game here. He teaches us an important lesson about who we blame for certain health conditions. And I think we all realize, uh, at least at my age, 
that President Bill Clinton had a problem with his heart. And a lot of us wanted to play the blame game and blame Ronald McDonald and blame his health habits. But I think it's time to reassess that, look back to the 1990s and reassess the health of this individual. Old school would say plaque in arteries is a disease and that you encourage that disease by eating McDonald's and not exercising, which is true. But is that the cause of the disease? Probably not. New school is that plaque is in our arteries. It's a natural part of the aging process. We can accelerate that process. We can uh, smoke cigarettes and make it faster. But do McDonald's hamburgers really cause plaque and arteries? No, plaque and arteries is part of a natural aging process. So old school would say heart disease comes from our bad habits. New school says heart disease and plaque just come because it's part of being human. Old school versus new school. Old school would say blame fast food and lack of exercise. That's true. It definitely accelerates plaque growth. But even if you are well behaved, even if you never touch any fast food in your life, you can still have a lot of plaque in your arteries. New school, plaque is to blame. Not knowing your plaque burden is to blame. Having genetics that increase your risk for plaque growth is to blame. Doctors who didn't intervene early enough to tell you you had plaque growing in your arteries are to blame. And lack of statin initiation is to blame because you will grow plaque often if you don't intervene. Tony's tips of the week, don't assume we have your records. This is all about medical records. Other doctors, emergency rooms, consultations, even Quest and LabCorp for labs, don't assume we have those. Uh, unfortunately, electronic medical records have actually slowed the transfer of a lot of uh, data and records. So if you can, let us know that you have medical records that we need to obtain. And if you can, bring them to your appointments, hand deliver them. Faxes actually require manual handling. So if you ask us to fax your records for a doctor's appointment, someone has to take those out of the fax machine and give them to the doctor. Someone has to take those records out of the fax machine and give them to me. So again, they need to be hand delivered. I cannot help you without good records. Furthermore, let's describe what the electronic medical record is. Electronic medical record, EMR, we use it at Sibley, Suburban, Hopkins, Virginia Hospital Center, MD Anderson, to name a few. They're all linked. They should all carry your records, which we can access. But it's time consuming. It's easier than faxing, but it still takes some time to log in and get to your account. You need to tell us you had that interaction with the doctor. If we don't know you had the interaction, Epic doesn't actually alert us that you did very easily. Uh, so let us know you had a, a mammogram done. Let us know you had a CAT scan. Don't expect us to automatically find out. The system does not work that way. There's no auto push to our office of your records. So if you got a test or procedure done or you saw a doctor at one of these locations, we don't automatically know that you were there that day. So we don't know to retrieve that record. Uh, medical records have decreased the doctor-to-doctor -doctor communication and timely transfer of records, and often there are a lot of mistakes in these electronic medical records. Don't ask us to fix your list, especially on Epic of medications, because everybody knows it's almost impossible to fix your medication list on Epic. We don't even try. Uh, give us at least a day lead time to transfer your records. It does take a while to get all those records over. Finally, for fast pitch, we're still in Breast Cancer Awareness Month, so get your annual mammogram. Uh, don't ignore your bladder, urethra, and prostate. That, the health of the genitourinary system is crucial. You don't want to end up in the ICU for six days with urosepsis. Also know your plaque burden and don't blame Ronald McDonald. Having plaque is just being human. What we should do is focus on how much do we have, how can we prevent it, how can we intervene. But I think at this point the blame game need not be played. We're just human. We're susceptible to plaque. We don't have to blame anyone. We just have to take action. Also, it's okay to get the flu shot with your boosters, and especially because Moderna and J&J &J will probably be approved by CDC this week, you could get your flu shot with them. If you get the high-dose flu shot, though, be careful. The high-dose flu shot is associated with more side effects. If you're planning on getting the high-dose flu shot, I would not get it with an mRNA vaccine because that's a lot of side effects you could be encountering. I just don't think it's worth it. And that's it for this week in medicine. Thank you.